Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for coming to a presentation on a product that will revolutionize the way cyclists travel and store their bicycles. This product was developed by five students out of Simon Fraser University's Mechatronic Systems Engineering Department in Surrey, British Columbia. Those five students are Eric Dietlifs, Armand Krishnar, Kevin Madrid, Andreas Palma, and Arjun Silota. To start off, uh, we looked into a number of issues in and around the cities that we have in our community, and we looked at our scopes. And one of the largest ones that came to our surprise was bicycle theft. Uh, looking into some Vancouver Police Department uh, publications as well as news articles, we found that Vancouver is actually the highest annual per capita uh, in terms of bike theft. And of all of those bikes that have stolen, um, less than 1% of them actually get a return to their respective owners. Um, this distilled the problem definition down for us to a point where we really wanted to focus on getting the bicycles back to the owners uh, who had their bicycles stolen from them in the first place. So to do so, we decided to develop our problem definition, get some concept uh, selection matrices going, and once we had our general idea ready to go, we split up into three teams. Those three teams were hardware, software, and integration. And now to continue on the presentation, I'd like to pass it off to the hardware team, Armand Krishnar and Andreas Palma. Take it away. Good day. My name is Armand Krishnar, and I am part of the hardware sub-team for MSE102's Team Alpha for this term. Two of the main things I focused on were hardware design using SolidWorks and Evil PCB, as well as the circuitry development using breadboards and a lot of jumper cables. Early on in the project, we had to distill down which features we needed in the final product, and to do so, we used a concept selection matrix with three main factors. The first one was cost, second one was ease of use for the final user, and the third was the specifications and difficulties associated with using a bicycle. This includes the vibrations the system would be under, weatherproofing, as well as the size constraints of placing a device on a bicycle. The final features we ended up choosing were twofold. Firstly, a tracking unit which would provide data to the end user stating where the bike is at all times, and secondly, a siren or an anti-theft deterrent to go on the bicycle that would alarm people around if someone tried to steal a bike. The original plan was to create a small tubular housing which would fit inside a bike frame, hiding all the components. Um, we ended up choosing to go with a proof of concept design for this round, and that involved making a small box which held all of the hardware and sticking it to the bottom of the bicycle seat. For the development of using the tubular design um, would allow us to have anti-tampering as well as hiding the device itself in, in uh, the public eye. Um, in terms of feature implementation, we needed to decide which sensors and which compute unit we would use to gather the data, interpret it, and tell us what's going on with the bicycle. For this, in our final design, we ended up using a Neo 6M GPS unit. Uh, the Neo 6M GPS unit collects data and coordinates and provides it to the compute unit whenever the compute unit triggers it. To do so, it has a patch antenna, very small, which makes it easier to hide within the bicycle frame. The, uh, the patch unit collects GPS data from three satellites in the sky and triangulates its position and then sends the raw data location directly to the compute unit. Now to continue on this hardware presentation, I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Andres Palma. Andres, it's all you. Hello, my name is Andres Palma. I mainly focus on hardware development and implementation. To continue with the features, the Siren was initially designed to use two small speakers powered by a small amplifier connected to the computing unit. As we progressed in design, we chose to switch the amp speaker system to a piezoelectric siren, which allows for a great deal of volume with a low power input. The siren used has a voltage input range of 7 to 15 volts DC, with a current draw of 300 milliamps. The circuit chosen to drive the siren was a 9 volt DC battery in series with an NPN transistor, and finally, the siren. When the gate of the NPN transistor is provided with a high input voltage by the computing unit, the current is permitted to flow from the collector to the emitter, and the siren is powered by the 9 volt battery. The circuit allows for a higher voltage supplied to the siren without damaging the computing unit. 
The computing unit chosen for this system was a Raspberry Pi Zero W. This computing unit was chosen for its low price, a wide variety of modularity, compact size, and its built-in low power Bluetooth transmitter. The Raspberry Pi Zero W is powered by a compact battery bank to allow for the system to be recharged. Sensory input to the Pi Zero includes the Neo 6M GPS and can have further modules added. The Pi continuously receives positional data from the GPS and if found to move significantly while the position of the user's cell phone is far, it will activate the NPN transistor to trigger the siren of the alarm. For the future development of this device, we could de we could have developed uh, on a single PCB, which would lessen the cost per unit and allow for a smaller circuit for footprint to make the system smaller and more discreet overall while hiding it inside the bike. Of course, the hardware of a system is only useful with the right software. As such, I would like to pass the presentation off to our software team, Arjun and Eric. Please take the floor. Hi, my name is Arjun Sahoda, and I'm on the software team. My main focus was specifically backend software development. So backend development is more focused on programming the Raspberry Pi and also receiving and interpreting commands from the user such as lock and unlock through the app. My main languages were first C and C++, so my first step was to develop a working knowledge of Python. Once I was familiarized with Python, I began learning specifics for this project. Unfortunately, due to the current conditions, I was unable to get much real practice done for the coding because I don't have the necessary components with me. So the first main functionality we needed for this project was GPS. We need GPS to continuously keep updating its location so the user can always know where the bike would be. For something to update continuously and just keep going on and on, you need to use in code what's called a while true loop, and then you put the conditions inside that, <clears throat> and that snippet of code keeps reevaluating. So the snippet of code shown on screen now shows the while loop and inside it, it has the variables for latitude and longitude. Beside that we can see what the basic output for the coordinates would look like. It shows the series of latitude and longitude coordinates and it just keeps going as long as the code is running. This now would need to be sent to an app where there would be displayed on a map. In order to update the coordinates in real time to an app or a website, we needed to use an API. So I was looking into an API called PubNub to provide that service. I chose PubNub because it is user friendly and free and also has the ability to deliver real time alerts, push notifications, and SMS messages to a phone or web page. Now, the next big thing for us was the speaker. So when the bike is placed in lock mode, the Pi would be programmed to set a distance radius of about 5 meters from its current location. If the bike leaves this radius, then the Pi would be programmed to send a voltage to the siren, which would make it go off. Another feature we had just began exploring before the shutdown was the use of a pressure sensor placed under the bike. If the bike was set to lock mode and the pressure sensor evaluated to true, that means someone else is on the bike, so it would trigger the alarm. We didn't get much time to work with the pressure sensor, however. Now I'll pass it on to the other member of the software team, Eric, to discuss front-end development. Hey, my name is Eric Dietlitz, and I'm the second team member responsible for the software development end of this prototype. My main task was working on the front end of the software, where I had to make sure that the user would be able to work with the program easily, and that it would appeal to them. This task included taking the information that Arjun's program would be acquiring, and finding a way to translate that information to the user in a friendly and easily understandable manner. I also had to figure out a way for the user to communicate with the device itself, telling it when to activate certain functions, such as only activating the tracker and not the alarm system. Now that we have a basic outline of what this program is supposed to do, let's take a look at how it looks. Once users open the app, they'll be brought to a login and registration section. New users will click on the registration tab where they are prompted to enter their full name, username, password, and their specific tracker serial number. Once they have registered, they'll be brought to the login tab where they'll be entering their username and password to log in. 
Once logged in, they'll be brought to the map of a general location of their phone's current location. As we see, this user only has one tracker active. If we activate this tracker, we can see that a red point is brought up. This shows the location of that tracker at that specific time. Users can click this point to see where this tracker is located. If we deactivate this tracker, we can now look at several different functions that are available to the user. Users will be able to click on the previous locations tab and see the 15 previous locations of where this tracker had been activated or deactivated. If we close this, we can see that the tracker is able to also activate only certain functions as previously mentioned. For example, we can activate only the alarm or we can activate only the tracker. Users will also be able to add multiple trackers to a specific account simply by going to the add tracker function where they'll be able to enter a new serial number and add that tracker. Easily enough, users are able to activate and deactivate as much as possible and it's easy as they can do. Now that we have the software and hardware part of this prototype finished, we are going to implement those things together where they will be sent off to the integration team. The integration team will then implement these two different sections of the prototype and figure out a way for them to be added to the bike itself. Hi, I'm Cameron and I'll be talking about the integration side of our prototype. Essentially, the job of the integration team was to figure out a way to get the electronic components of the GPS and alarm system onto the bike. This involved finding the optimal placement for the components and then deciding the appropriate housing to put those components in. Initially, we thought of placing the components into the bike frame itself to keep them hidden from the weather and making it more difficult to tamper with. This inspired the idea for a tubular housing that we put into the frame under the seat and designed so it would be easily removable for maintenance. However, the components purchased were too big and could not fit in the housing with the same radius as that of the bike frame. Another idea for the housing was to mold a warm, malleable plastic sheet to the bottom of the seat to ensure a perfect fit around the bike seat's mounting hardware. But given our limited access to resources, this idea was scrapped. Therefore, the team decided that the most practical housing and placement for a prototype was a small box fastened underneath the bike seat. As for some noteworthy components, the battery would be placed in the box along with the other components. The alarm would be attached to the bike seat separately, though still under the seat, with a wire connecting it to the box and all the other components and the data from the Raspberry Pi would be sent through Wi-Fi. If a finalized product were to be made, instead of a small box under the seat, a version of the tubular housing would be used and placed in the frame underneath the seat. This design would be the most secure, the most hidden, protected from the weather, and easily accessible for maintenance. The housing would be sealed with either an O-ring or gasket depending on the finalized design, and the electronics would be potted, so the coating would make the circuit resistant to damage by vibration or moisture. In addition, the battery would be set outside of the housing, though still in the bike frame, so it would be easy to remove and charge when necessary. And lastly, instead of having the Raspberry Pi send the data to the website through Wi-Fi, it would be sent through a cellular data connection or something of this sort. So, in conclusion, the team set out and produced a GPS tracker that could replace or be used in tandem with a bike lock. Through data acquired by reading news articles from across the globe, as well as running a survey, the team was easily able to determine how to resolve the issue that was most distinct in bike thefts. Specifically, create a product which helps victims of bike theft relocate their stolen bikes. Through running the surveys, we were also able to determine our budget for the prototype, as well as the amount of people that would prefer a tracker over a bike lock. Our goal to Resolve the problem of having bikes stolen and not being recovered was achieved. It must, however, be emphasized that this prototype was not meant to be a finished system. There are a multitude number of ways in which the system remains unfinished. For example, the device still remains exposed and not theft-proof, and the mobile app should be readily available for users who do not have phones. Both these situations could easily be resolved when moving forward with the final design. Another flaw that one could encounter with a tracking device is to keep the users safe from their devices being compromised and used in an unlawful way. The importance of this prototype lies in the fact that it has demonstrated that there is an alternative approach 
to how we secure our bikes and equipment in general by allowing it to be stolen, knowing that it will be recovered no matter what happens. Not only is this prototype in many respects a good test system for further research and development, but it also helps push boundaries in both the security of items and the integrity of people around us. Has this ever happened to you? Vancouver has the highest per capita annual bike theft numbers in Canada. Police report less than 1% of bicycles found are returned to their owners as they cannot be identified. Introducing the Bike Security System. The Bike Security System was designed by a team of students looking to make travel to and from school more reliable and less stressful. The device uses a specialized system of sensors to detect unauthorized bicycle movement when the user is away. The Bike Security System has a system of sensors built into it that allows it to know what's going on around it and where it is at all times. If being used without the owner's knowledge, an incredibly loud siren will blare, alerting those around the bicycle to the actions of the thief. The system also alerts the owner via cell phone notification, where they can disarm the system. In cases of exceptional persistence, the bike security system truly shines. In addition to an alarm, the system includes a GPS tracker which will update the owner to its position regularly, allowing for easier location and recovery by the owner or authorities.